preserved this uh, for us. Therefore, let us pay careful attention to it. Then Moses spoke the words of this song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his way is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. No foreign God was with him. He made him ride on the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled him with the honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, curds from the herd and milk from the flock, with fat of lambs, rams of Bashan and goats, with the very finest of the wheat. And you drank foaming wine made from the blood of the grape. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. Thus far, our reading from the Old Covenant, please turn now to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 2, we will begin our reading with verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come now to take your word and to engrave it on our souls, to open our eyes that we might behold Christ, to unplug our ears that we might hear him speaking truth and grace to our lives. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We appeal to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
For many people, life is like the game of Monopoly. The goal is to accumulate as much money and property as you can. Hell is going to jail where you can't accumulate more property. Salvation is either buying your way out or by having a get out of jail free card or else rolling doubles, which depends on the roll of the dice. I haven't played in a while. I'm trying to remember these rules. In other words, skill plus money plus a little luck, that's how you play the game. And that's how many people play life. People rely on what they do. People rely on what they have and, and hope just a little bit of luck will get them through until the end. Well, in our text today, the Apostle Paul has been arguing against that way of thinking. That skill and possessions and a little bit of luck would have anything to do with your life and with your salvation. Salvation is not something to be purchased out of who we are or what we might accomplish. Rather, we're dead in our sins. We're enslaved to uncontrollable passions. And we are people facing the wrath of a holy God against us. Our only hope, Paul argues, is by grace, through faith. Now some would, and indeed some have seized on this, that if salvation is by grace, if there's nothing we can do to make God attractive to us, then therefore, it doesn't matter what we do. We can do whatever we want to do. And God will have to do his work of salvation because that's his job. If salvation is not by works, but only by grace, then we have a license for whatever you want to do. Yet in fact, as we look here, especially in verse 10 today, as Paul brings his argument of the opening paragraph of the body of the letter, as he, as he brings it to a conclusion, he shows that the efficacy of grace necessitates the presence of good works. Not as the cause of our salvation, but as the necessary consequence of salvation because we have been recreated in Christ. The efficacy of grace necessitates the presence of good works, not as the cause, but as the necessary consequence of our salvation because we have been made new in Christ. As we rest on God's grace, we live out the good works which God has prepared for us. Now, this is because, first, new creation. New creation is the necessary cause of salvation by grace. Notice he says in verse 10, having said, uh, we're saved by grace through faith, not your own doing, the gift of God, not of works, so no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. The first word we read in the English text is the word for. This is a causal particle for this reason, because. Why are we 
us saved not by our own doing, but by God's gift, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Why can't we boast? Because, for we are God's workmanship. We, that is, those who have been saved by grace through faith. In the previous two verses, he spoke in the second person, you, for by grace have you been saved through faith. But now he's joining himself to them and saying, for we are his workmanship. We, all of us who believe, are his workmanship, his, that is, God's workmanship. And in the Greek text, that pronoun his is all the way at the front. So it literally says, his workmanship we are. Some people would think of Yoda. He would reverse sentences like that. But, but what it does is it puts the emphasis on his, God's, God's workmanship we are. His workmanship are we. Now that word workmanship in our text is found only two times in the New Te Greek New Testament. Here and in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 referring to what God has created. It's not the normal word for created thing, but it conveys a sense of handiwork of care in crafting, of masterpiece, as it were. Indeed, the New Living Translation translates it masterpiece. The NIV, uh, I think, translated uh, handiwork. We are his handiwork. So there's a sense, you see, of craft, of design for those who believe. That means you have been handcrafted by God. God has made us who believe to be his own handiwork, his own masterpiece. He's made us who previously were dead in our transgressions and sin, who were enslaved to passions over which we had no control, who were under God's verdict of wrath and judgment. But we now have been handcrafted by God, created in Christ Jesus to be God's own masterpiece of grace. You know, you think of an artist, uh, whether someone is painting. Uh, for someone like me who's not very artistic, it, it just amazes me and humbles me how with just a few tubes of paint and a brush, such a beautiful picture can be created. Or when I, when I listen to, to, to music, and, and hear words and sounds come together, whether we sing hymns or, or whether we sing uh, a text uh, that, say, Seth or Katie have written. It, it just astounds me that, that they were able to put all that together and produce something so wonderful and something so beautiful. And you see, in salvation, we who believe are God's work of artistry. It, it's, and the fact that there is a new creation, indeed it says we are created in Christ Jesus. We have been created in his sphere, as it were. We have been joined to Christ. And in being joined to Christ, We've been made new. He, he uses this word creation or created uh, later on in 
Verse 15 of chapter 2, that he, God, might create in himself one new man in place of the two. God's work of creation. Something amazing. One new man where there used to be two. He created this. Again, in Ephesians 4, verse 24, he says, We are to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In his letter, his second letter to the Corinthians, as we have called it, chapter 5, verse 17, he says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. New creation. In Galatians 6, verse 15, he says, Neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but new creation. That's what matters, that there's a new creation. It's not that we've done something, either that we've got ourselves circumcised or that we refrain from being circumcised. It's not that we've done some great work of piety that demands that God look at us. Rather, we are God's creation. And if we are God's creation, he is the creator. John Stott writes, salvation is creation, recreation, new creation. And creation language is nonsense unless there is a creator. Self-creation is a patent contradiction in terms. If there is creation, there has to be a creator. And God is our creator. As Martin Lloyd-Jones says, God is the active one. We do not make ourselves the Christian. In new creation, when God creates us anew, the Apostle John speaks of this as a new birth. In John 3, I tell you the truth, if anyone would see the kingdom of heaven, he must be born again. Again, verse 5, if anyone would enter the kingdom, he must be born of water and the Spirit from above. A new birth, a new creation. And therefore, if that is what salvation is, that we are made new in Christ, it has to be by grace. Because God has done it all. God has made us new. He is the creator. New creation requires is the necessary cause of salvation by grace. Grace is absolutely necessary to our salvation, and it takes away any possibility that we have saved ourselves. Now, if new creation is necessary cause of salvation by grace, good works are the necessary consequence of salvation by grace. He writes here, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepares beforehand. There's a little bit of a word play here. He speaks of us being God's workmanship. We are God's work. For good works. He's trying to get it firmly fixed in our head. We're not saved by works, but we are saved for good works. Not by works, but for good works. That's the part. There's that word for again, though actually it's a different preposition, but it's a preposition that also conveys purpose. Salvation by grace is not a license to sin. It is a commission to serve, to serve God by doing good works, to be what God has made us to be, his masterpiece, his creation. Earlier it said that God would display throughout the age to come His grace at work in us. We are a a picture of grace for the whole creation to see. 
And so we don't have a license to sin, to live any way we want, but rather we have a commission to serve in the good works. And those good works are in marked contrast in verse 10 to the works which cannot save us in verse 9. We are not saved by works, but for works. J. Armitage Robinson writes this. It says, not of works, but unto works. The divine purpose is not achieved apart from the good works of men. Only it does not begin from them, but leads to them. They are included in the divine will for man. They are ready for our doing, and we are created to do them. So you see, there's no, there's no contradiction between between saying that we are not saved by works, but only by grace, and saying that we are saved for good works. Being a new creation <coughs> is a necessary cause of salvation by grace, but good works are the necessary consequence of salvation by grace. And in order to drive that home even further, that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, he goes on to say, which God prepared beforehand. Which God prepared beforehand. Now there's a little bit of an echo here to what he had previously stated in his great word of praise, his doxology, in chapter 1, verse 4, where he said, even as... God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, so that we should be holy and blameless before him. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ before any of us ever existed in order that we should be holy and blameless when we did come into our existence. God prepared beforehand good works. Now by saying that God prepared these good works beforehand, this is further affirmation that our good deeds are not due to our own effort and resolve, but due only to divine grace because God had prepared them before we even did them. And therefore, it's all up to God and his mercy and grace to us, and not because we're smart enough or spiritual enough or work hard enough or are beautiful enough or are worthy enough. No, it's all of him. He prepared beforehand the very things he calls us to do. Now, that means that if God's grace has come to you, that God has good works for you to do. There's no place for saying as a Christian, oh, I don't have any gifts, I, I'm, I'm worthless, I have nothing to offer. If you have been created new in Christ, there are works that God has already prepared for you to do. It's not a matter of, woe is me, I'm a horrible person, but rather, what are the things that God wants me to do? There's no calling for saying, I'm, I'm worthless before God. There's nothing I can do. When he has declared you his masterpiece, when he has created you anew for good works that he has for you to do. Your past is past. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. You have been set free from the bondage to your past. 
if you have been made new in Christ. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's what Jesus said. And this leads to our final point. Good works are the necessary completion of salvation by grace. Notice what he says. Which created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. Walk is a word that can be used literally of walking about, but usually the Apostle Paul uses it in a more figurative sense in terms of our conduct, our walk, the Christian walk, meaning how do Christians behave, how do they conduct themselves, how do we comport ourselves living in a sinful world. And he says that God has prepared in advance, good works, that we should walk in them. What's really interesting is that he would end this paragraph, this opening paragraph of the body of his letter, that we should walk in them when he began his opening paragraph in chapter 2, verse 2, saying that, in which we once walked in sins and trespasses. So he starts out by saying, you walked, you're dead, walking in sins and trespasses, and he concludes the paragraph by saying that God has prepared good works, contrary, contrastingly to the dead works, of sin and trespass, and in the middle, what, what is being bookended here? Salvation by grace through faith. Good works are the necessary completion to our salvation by grace through faith. It's what ties the whole thing up in one bundle of goodness to sinners like you and like me. But what does this walk look like? What are these good works that God prepared in advance for us to do? Well, what he does here by using the language of walking is to prepare for the second half of his epistle where he lays out what a Christian looks like. Because the theme running throughout chapter 4, 5, and 6 is how are Christians to walk. So, for example, in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And then again in verse 17, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. No, you walk a different way from them. In chapter 5, verse 2, he says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to the Lord. In verse 8 of chapter 5, he says, Walk as children of light. In verse 15 of chapter 5, he says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time. God has prepared good works in advance for us to walk in. And we can't say there's no good way in which we can walk. We have nothing to do because God has already prepared the way. And he says, walk. But notice that even our walking is not simply by human effort, but rather it begins with God. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. But verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and work for his good pleasure. God is working in you. You are working it out what God is working in. But you see, it is as we work it out that our salvation is brought to a completion. It's not merely that, that God has prepared the good works, but now those good works are being revealed as we live them out and work them out. Not as Paul cries out in Romans 5, what shall we sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. No, we work out what God has worked in. He has made us a new creature. He's made us to live. He's taken us out of death from sin and given us life by his spirit. A couple weeks ago, we read from Ezekiel 37, the, the valley of dry bones that the prophet saw and all he saw were all these dry, sun-dried bones. There's no flesh on them at all. Death just staring them in the face, but... The wind of the Spirit came, and he prophesied life, and, and these dead bones came together. God is making alive. What God works in, we work out and bring that salvation to completion, a salvation that is by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. New creation is the necessary cause of salvation by grace. God is the one doing the creating. It's by his grace, not by our effort. But good works are a necessary consequence of salvation by grace. Because we were created in Christ, we were joined together with Christ so that we might live, that we might live out the good works that God has already prepared. And so good works are the necessary completion to our salvation, showing that we have been made alive by Christ. Now there's a warning in this. If there are no good works, of any kind in your life, then we need to ask the question, why are there no good works? Could it be that we're not alive? Could it be that we're not alive? But some of you are overly critical of yourself. You need to hear the encouragement that if you truly believe God has good works for you to do and those good works will come because God has prepared them in advance for you to do. And so if you walk by faith, you live by faith and follow the Lord. And if you don't see the good works in the way that you think they ought to be, but you believe and you love the Lord, then you will, then the thing to do is to start walking. And he will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. You see, we walk, but God is the one guiding. And we walk in the good works that he prepared in advance to do. Peter O'Brien writes, it is God's will that those who belong to the new creation should be characterized by a lifestyle which ultimately reflects his own character and action. That's what God wants. That's why we are saved by grace through faith. That's why he makes us new. Left to ourselves, we're dead in our sins. We're subject only to judgment. But now because he has made us alive, we are his masterpiece. And it will be that our lives, that your lives, as you walk after Jesus, will redound to his praise and glory. Because these are the very good works that he prepared you to do. When 
a craftsman makes when Stradivarius made one of his violins. He made it to produce a certain sound. Yes, it, it had to be, uh, the bow had to be applied to the strings, but he made it to produce a sound. God has made us to be his masterpiece. Now, if you have never put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then your life is pretty empty. And the best sound that will come out of your life is like fingernails across a chalkboard, if you are old enough to remember what a chalkboard is and how that sounds. It's awful. But the good news is that while there's nothing you can do to make your life any better, it is by grace that you are saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that God sent his own son to die because of your sins, that he might bear the wrath in judgment that you deserve. And it is Christ that gives life, and as you trust in him, you receive that life and you begin to live. So friends, go and live, shine, to the glory of God. Live for Jesus and let his masterpiece be seen and heard 